Hey guys, welcome back. So today we're going to do a little bit of classic Mac in terms of video content. We're going to reach back into the archives of my gun library and grab an old rifle that's actually quite uncommon. And the rifle you see before you here today is the rifle I want to talk about. This is the RIC carbine or the uh, Royal Irish Constabulary carbine. This rifle was developed for a paramilitary type police force in Ireland. Uh, the police force, quasi police force, somewhat mixed between National Guard and police force, shall we say, was established in the 1820s and was disbanded in 1920, 1922. So it had about a hundred year run, but they had a special need for a particular rifle that they wanted. And so they made a request and this would be the end result of that request, which made for a very unique carbine. So let's take a closer look at the RIC infield carbine that I have here sitting on the table before me. A lot of folks ask me, how can I get involved in the firearms business in that particular community? And one of the best ways to do that is to become a gunsmith. Every gunsmith I know is just overbooked with work. It's a very good living. And so if you would like to become a gunsmith, you need to go to a gunsmithing school or become an apprentice for an existing gunsmith. But Modern Gun School is an accredited college that also works with veterans in the GI Bill, where you can go and get a degree from accredited college in gunsmithing and then go out and start your own gunsmithing business which I think is a really great option. Again, throughout my entire life, gunsmiths have always been able to earn a really good living, assuming they have a really strong work ethic. So please check out Modern Gun School. I do have a link in the video description below. The RIC rifle that you see here would have been based on the early Lee Enfield pattern rifles that you would have seen being used during World War I or the Lee Metford series of rifles. And it is based on one of those early Lee Enfield uh, carbines. Now this one you can tell is manufactured by Enfield because it says Enfield right on the receiver. And there's some other basic visual cues like the sling swivel being down here uh, on the infield version, the Metford would have had a different sling swivel on the side of the stock. So you can tell this one was based off of an infield manufactured rifle. Now the carbines were one of those things that uh, military struggled with for quite some time is either a long rifle or a carbine like this. And then they came up with short rifles that would have, you know, slightly longer barrels. And so this carbine would have been repurposed from those early infield rifles and carbines and because it couldn't be upgraded to the next generation rifle, which we'll show you in the next segment to the SMLE rifle, these are just given away. So when the Irish said, we need some rifles, we have some special needs, Enfield or the Brits just donated the guns to them and they had some special requests. So one of those requests would be for a bayonet lug. Most carbines of the era would not have a bayonet lug. Uh, keep in mind, we're talking late 1800s, early 1900s, and believe it or not, cavalry was still being used. As a matter of fact, the Poles did a cavalry charge in World War II. So the bayonet on a carbine really kind of defeated the whole purpose. Generally speaking, a carbine was intended to be used by uh, horse soldiers and they would have sabers and things like that. So they'd have no need for a bayonet. So they wanted a bayonet lug. And so the stock had to be modified and then they had to make this bayonet adapter out there on the end. It has the absence of a muzzle device but the rest of it is going to be very similar to an early Lee Enfield rifle. So it's a, it's a really neat piece. Again, not many of these are in existence. They would have just been used and abused. Every single example I've seen has been about this condition or worse. So I couldn't give you a number on how many of these might actually be in the United States. But let's just take a look at this rifle. It, it does chamber 303 Brit. So the Brits had used that cartridge for quite some time through a number of different rifles. And so this rifle is no different. It does chamber the 303 British cartridge. It does have an internal magazine that would be familiar to anybody that's familiar with Enfield. So you have the magazine release right there in the trigger guard. And you'll notice this is shorter than the magazines that you'll find in like the number four series rifle or the SMLE, but it works in the same way. An interesting feature of the gun is that here we have a dust cover covering the action of the rifle. When you open it up, you'll notice it's not feeding. Even though I have six rounds in the magazine, 
it's not going to feed because of this plate. This is a plate that blocks magazine feed because military doctrine of the time, the US military did this with the 1903 Springfields. You would just throw one round in, fire the weapon, and then uh, take another round from your cartridge belt, throw it in, fire the weapon until the order was given to fire from the magazine. Then you would pull this out and then you could fire six shots in rapid succession before having to reload the rifle. So that's kind of a throw over to that old military doctrine but still kind of cool to see. Out here, we have very simple sights. You can see the V-notch, but what's kind of funny is it has the increments <laughs> all the way up. Well, this little thing's kind of seized, I don't want to force it, but you can, you can slide it up to unrealistic distances that would simply be impractical for a carbine of this type to engage targets at that distance. So generally speaking, they would have been used with the V-notch and then the simple front blade sight, which is actually more or less a pyramid. You'll notice the bolt head and things like that on it uh, are very similar to later versions of the Enfield rifle. You'll also notice this thing has a ton of markings all over it. And that is because these guns were handed around and they were, uh, you know, they, they're leftovers from a war and then they were passed around as military aid, wind up being given to the RIC. And so they're going to have all sorts of proof marks, acceptance marks and things like that on them. As far as uh, clones go, I, I warn you guys when you're buying collectibles like this, to be very careful because people like to clone very valuable and rare firearms. This would, would be classified as a very rare firearm. This would be a difficult one to clone. So I'm not saying they don't exist, but because of the unique stock, if somebody could get their hands on these rare stocks and then the bayonet lug that's out here to complete it, it would be a, a really valiant effort on their part to clone it to get a few extra bucks. So let's do a little bit of shooting with the rifle. It's, it's, it's generally speaking, the manual of arms is gonna be identical to later infield rifles you may be, may be more familiar with, like the SMLE, like the number four and stuff like that. So it cocks on closing. We have a safety here, which is interesting, right? So this is gonna be different than you're gonna find on later infields. The safety on the later infields would be over here on the side of the receiver. So up is safe, down is fire. This is your striker. So you can, and you'll see it's knurled so you can grab a hold of it and release that striker. So now it has a loaded magazine with the plate covering it, nothing in the chamber striker down. So it would be safe for carry. If I needed to ready the weapon for firing, I just simply yank this out, run the bolt, and the gun is ready to fire. So safety was definitely one of those things that they were concerned with. If you take a look at the buttstock, 303 is a little bit of a brute in terms of a cartridge, in terms of punishment. And so having a brass buttstock is, uh, is going to transfer all that recoil energy right to the shooter's shoulder. But honestly, guys, if you've shot 12 gauge shotguns and things like that, the recoil on this isn't going to be any worse. So people that say that these are, you know, recoil monsters and stuff, I've, I've shown like Steyr and 95s and things like that. People talk about them being bruisers. Yeah, I guess like jungle carbines and stuff, if you're not used to shooting a 12 gauge. Not the case with these. So you can shoot these fairly comfortably for quite some time. So let's do a little bit of shooting with the gun. That's what I enjoy the most. So to my point, let me turn my ears on here. So to my point, I have the magazine loaded. I have been able to get six rounds into the magazine and, and, and be able to push the cutoff across. I can get seven rounds into the magazine, but the cutoff at that point does not work. Okay, so to shoot it, I'm just gonna do a couple of single loads and then I'm gonna give myself the order to fire from the magazine. Hopefully the magazine spring is still good. So fire this old girl, we'll just do it this way. Just throw a round in there and close the bolt. You don't have to be careful. You don't have to get the nose into the chamber. Everything should line up nice and easily. And then nice strong ejection. Just grab another round, just throw it in there and close the bolt and she's ready to fire again. So now if you wanted to go to magazine fed, all you have to do is grab this little tab. You can see it's knurled and kind of enlarged. Just grab it and pull it out. And that pops the magazine up. And now you see how it's picking around up. Now she can fire from the magazine. So again, recoil's not that bad, has that familiar infield action. As you can see, watch the striker, it can cock on close, right? So that's very normal for this type of an action that would be carried over in the later versions. And then one thing I like to do to decock it, there's nothing in the chamber. I can hold the trigger back with one finger, push the bolt forward and drop it down. 
and now I didn't have to worry about letting that slip. Even if there was a round in the chamber, it wouldn't fire because it eases it home when the bolt goes home. To ready the gun, if there were a round in the chamber, which I wouldn't recommend doing, all you have to do is cock it by pulling the striker to the rear and then the weapon's ready to fire. So the rifle that would come after the early Lee Enfield and Metford rifles would be the rifle you see here. This is the SMLE, very iconic rifle based on the same basic action, but with a number of different changes. Now, this video isn't about the SMLE. I just wanted to show you how this action that you see here has evolved from this to this. So you'll notice things like the cutoff is no longer present on the SMLE. You'll notice that the striker assembly is different. The safety that is present on the striker here has been moved over to the left-hand side of the receiver here. Uh, the striker is still present. You can still cock it. You can still decock it in the way that I had mentioned before, but there are a number of differences. You'll notice a, a very prominent uh, stripper clip guide up here, a larger magazine. The magazine drops out in the same manner, but I will say that this magazine and this magazine are not compatible. You'll notice on the earlier infields, there's like a lip on the front of the mag that's not present on later versions of the gun. So it's, uh, it's, it's slightly different. And keep in mind, guys, these magazines weren't intended to be loaded and carried in magazine pouches like we do today. These magazines were meant to be left in the gun and stripper clips would be used to reload the, the firearm through the top. The only reason the magazines are really removable is in case they get damaged, you can easily replace them. But again, they're not intended to be used as your primary source of carrying ammunition. That would have been left to the stripper clip. The operation of the gun is very similar. You'll notice it has very similar bolt features, although there's no dust cover covering this one like there was on the RIC carbine. But we still have the forward rear sight, still have a simple blade post out here, and then we have the wood furniture that goes all the way out. This rifle would evolve yet again when World War II came about into the number four, which is probably one of my favorite infield type rifles and uh, would be the last evolutionary step really of this particular rifle before the Brits went on to self-loading rifles like the FAL or the L1A1. All right, so since we got it out, we might as well do a little bit of shooting with it. Put a couple rounds into the magazine here. And look guys, this type of firearm, these types of firearms are really meant for collectors and enthusiasts. My good friend James Reeves, who I actually just saw at IWA in Germany last week, we were joking about his dislike for old firearms like this. He's more into Glocks and AR-15 stuff that's more practical by today's standards, right? This You're not going to go out and typically defend your property, life, and country with an RIC carbine. This thing is obsolete by most measure. Not to say it's not an effective weapon. It certainly is. But he just has no interest in these. So why do I have an interest in firearms like this? Look at this rifle, folks. First of all, it was developed for a very special purpose for a unit that most people probably have never heard of. Look at all the dings and marks and all the stampings on the receivers. This gun has passed through the hands of so many different troops, police, soldiers. It has history. There's an A etched into the stock and it's not new. Some soldier or RIC officer did that. These things have history, lots of history conflict history, bouncing around in the patrol vehicle, maybe even on horseback. That's what draws me to these is because it's the history. If it weren't for tools like this, nations like the United States wouldn't exist. Our nation was built on the fact that, you know, people with a strong will to live free took up arms against a king and fought for their freedom with tools like this, right? So that's why my interest in older firearms is there. Still love the AR-15, still love the Glock, still love all the modern stuff, but my heart and my passion are with these types of firearms because of the history of these firearms. Uh-oh, stuck case, a little bit of PPU ammo there. just pleasant, fun rifles to shoot. Now this rifle's quite a bit bigger, quite a bit heavier than the RIC carbine. So the 303 Brit in this thing is really nothing. Uh, you know, m my kids can shoot this thing comfortably. There's, there's very little uh, recoil in terms of pain associated with it. But this little guy, I love it because it is so different 
so rare. And honestly, this is the first one I have ever seen. And it was being carried around over the shoulder of a gentleman at a gun show. And he wanted to get rid of it. He didn't know the history on it. Uh, he offered a price. I thought the price was good. I really didn't know what they were worth. And it turns out I got a very good deal once I got home and did a little bit of research on their current values. So this thing just happened into my hands by luck, by just stumbling across the right guy at a gun show with a rifle slung over his shoulder he wanted to sell. And the prices at gun shows have gotten ridiculous, but because of individual sellers out there selling stuff like this, there's still some pretty good deals to be had. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video, kind of stepping back in time, doing a little bit of a classic Mac video, bringing out the old RIC carbine. If you have any questions about this firearm, you can ask those questions in the comments section down below. I do try to stick around after the first couple of days when a video goes live to answer any questions you guys may have. Also, if you'd like to support us here at the Military Arms channel so we can continue to bring you content like this, have direct access to me, I answer all private communications, get early access to videos, things like that, check out our Patreon. There is a link in the video description below. Right here on YouTube, you got the thanks and subscribe button underneath the video player you're watching right now. Mash either one of those buttons and you can support us right here on YouTube in the age of demonetization. Please swing by, check out Copper Custom. Thank you for 16 years of support and we'll talk to you guys soon.